Okay, so hi everyone. I'm glad that we are back to this seminar. Um, so today we are going to listen to the talk of Xavier Aubriat. Um, just um, as an introduction, so he's a botanist with major interest in species diversity. Uh, his botanical training uh, comes from his master and PhD that he performed in Paris Museum, um, where he worked on the gymnosophobia. Um, but also his passion for selenium, he comes from a postdoc that he performed during the, uh, between 2000, 2013 and 2016 at the Natural History Museum, working with Sandina. And, and currently he has a permanent position at the University of Paris, Sacre, uh, where he continues working, working on, on selenium and also as well in other plant groups. Um, but uh, Xavier is also interested in and uh, is involved in several projects linked the, with the evolution of floral traits and also the relationship between gold, wax, and uh, host plants. So we are very glad that um, Xavier is going to talk today about the tropical Asian uh, spiny solenum. And so now you can share the screen and you can start with that. Thank you. <laughs> Good, thank you, Roger. Here is my screen, so I hope that everyone can see uh, the slides. Um, so first, uh, I would like to thank uh, all the organizing team of the Solanaceae conference because it's uh, conferences because it's a fantastic opportunity to uh, to see all of you, to meet all of you, and to discuss together. And there are many persons I never met physically, so uh, so it's a it's a great moment. Uh, and uh, as a um, as a botanist, uh, I'm. I'm, I'm love plants and there is one group of plants that I love with all of you in common that I have I have this love with all of you in common and it's Solanaceae and for me it's more particularly uh, the genus Solanum and the spiny Solanum and I'm interested mostly in the biodiversity of uh, the tropical Asian spiny Solanum. So first uh, Rocio sorry here yeah. Yeah, Rocio has already said several words about it, but I'm just going to briefly uh, talk a bit about my, my courses, uh, what I've my curriculum, what I've done previously. So I've done a PhD at the Paris Museum where I've learned about taxonomy and phylogenetics uh, in foreign plants. Uh, I've worked on another giant genus, so the genus Euphorbia, uh, with Pete Laurie and Thomas Vermans, that were both my uh, PhD advisors. Uh, then I've done a postdoc at the Natural History Museum with Sandy Knapp, so working on the eggplant and all the wide relations of the eggplant, and particularly uh, the tropical uh, Asian uh, relatives of the eggplant. And after several experiences, uh, jobs in France, uh, I've managed to get a position so at the University Paris Saclay, which is a university in the south of Paris. Uh, where indeed I'm still working on selenium as well as another group of uh, plants. So this, um, this monograph, this taxonomical work on uh, tropical Asian spiny selenium is very important for me. It's something critical. And I have to say that it's a, it has been actually a long-standing personal challenge. Uh, it's not easy to do a monograph and it's not easy to do a monograph of selenium species. And when I began my postdoc in 2013, uh, I did many things. I did many things uh, on molecular biology, so doing a lot of labs. Uh, I've been on the field in Thailand, in India, and I've spent a lot of time in, in Herbaria, all across Europe and also in other countries. And by two years after the beginning of the postdoc, uh, I think that something like a quarter of the monograph was done. So it's not very satisfying. Because at the end also of the postdoc, after having published several papers on several subjects on the phylogeny, but also a bit on the taxonomy of this tropical Asian spiny selenium, something like a bit more than a half of the monograph was done. And sadly also, uh, it, it didn't evolve too much during the, the, the last years. But actually, I can tell you that now uh, it's a very happy time for me because uh, something like between 80 to 90 percent, what I assume to be between 80 and 90 percent of the monograph is now nearly fulfilled. So it's nearly the end of this very long process of, um, of doing our monographs and DNI 
of, uh, of the tropical Asian spiny selenium. And what I want to share with you today is the whole process, and above all, uh, the, the very interest uh, that you can find in such, uh, in such a group. So you all know uh, selenium, well, most of you, and many of you know the spiny selenium. Actually, spiny selenium, uh, it's also another name, a more scientific name, is subgenus leptostemonum, and these clades account for a third of the diversity of selenium. So it's a gigantic clade. And uh, it's a clade that is diversified in the southern hemisphere, either in the old world or the new world. Uh, but you will have species of uh, spiny selenium everywhere in the tropics. Some are very well known, like uh, selenum torven, the piek plant in the new world, or and, and introduced in the old world, and selenum insanum, which is the white progenitor sorry, of the eggplant of the aubergine. Um, of course, we call them spiny selenum. So indeed, they are spiny. Actually, they have what we call prickles, uh, and that we can find often everywhere on the plant, on the twigs, on the leaves, on the petals, also on the calyx sometimes, but it's most of the time. You also have many species that are uh, unarmed, that are enormous without prickles. What really characterizes, in a way, uh, these uh, spiny selenum morphologically is that you will very, most of the time, nearly always, you will have stellate hairs uh, on the different plant parts of uh, the different species. The hairs are not always stellate. You will also have uh, simple hairs, simple tritons. First, but like in the huge majority, either, well, except if the plant is glabrous, you will always find one or two stellate tritons. Uh, in terms of uh, floral features, it's much more, uh, well, it's, it's not that very interesting when you first look at specimens uh, in herbaria, because usually the flowers and fruits are very conserved. They show quite few variation, as you can see a bit here. The, the flowers are stellate, sometimes a, uh, a bit less stellate, uh, but they are often very, very, uh, very stellate. And, uh, and the fruits are always kind of globular, except for some uh, well-known examples, like, for example, the eggplant. They can be hairy, like, for example, the hair of uh, the fruit, sorry, of Selenum lasiocarpum, but often they are glabrous. So, it, so it's not very viable at first glance in terms of flowers. Actually, there is something that is very viable in this group. It's uh, the sexual system. Uh, sexual systems, indeed, the sexuality of the plants, is something that is very viable between species and even among species in this group. So the huge majority of spiny selenum are hermaphrodite with bisexual flowers all over the plant. But you also have many species that are andromonoaceous. And I think many of you know what it is, but andromonoaceous is when you have the distal flowers of the inflorescences, so the flowers that are uh, at the top, most of the time, that are uh, male only, functionally speaking. And at the base of the plant, you will have one or two flowers, uh, one or several flowers, but not many, that are hermaphrodites and that are, going to give, that, that are going to give rise to fruits. So uh, this is typical in this, uh, in this group. You have many species like that, like, for example, the eggplant, Solanum melongena. And you also have, but this is much less common, this is, this is, this is much more rare, um, dioecious species, where well, they are functionally dioecious, uh, with male and female uh, plants. But this just concerns several species in, uh, in some Australian plants. Uh, what is interesting also is that uh, you have this sexual plasticity within species. So, for example, you can find uh, germ plasm of eggplant that are fully hermaphrodites. So, here it's a, a germ plasm from uh, the bank of Avignon, uh, that is uh, an eggplant that is fully hermaphrodite. So the sexuality that is not stable and can vary uh, inside the species. So Leptostemonum, as, uh, as you know, uh, is a natural group. It's a monophyletic group, it's a clade. And it's a clade that is very well supported, as uh, we can see it in the uh, huge phylogeny of Sarkin and et al. in 2013. But what is also very interesting is that in this clade, you have a clade, a group, 
that gathers the huge majority of the old world species. So you have a clear distinction between the new world species and the old world species that are massively uh, incorporated into one big plate. Now, in terms of taxonomy, because we are interesting here primarily about taxonomy. In terms of taxonomy, the picture is complex because it's a complex group. So I won't speak too much of the new world species. I won't speak at all, actually, of the new world species of the one of, uh, of South America and Central America. There are many, they are very diverse, and we don't really know exactly uh, the diversity. It's around 250 species, but I assume that it's much bigger. Uh, in the old world, a long thought to be a not diverse uh, place for the genus uh, Leptostemonum, actually you have a huge diversity for, uh, for this group. So the major diversity is in Australia and New Guinea with something like 180 species, but this is variable. This is not stable, the number of species in this zone, because as you, as you have seen, uh, there are many species, well, yeah, many species of Australian of Australia, for Australia and for New Guinea that are still described today and that needs to be described in the future. Um, we can cite the two revisions of Simon, so the great Australian botanist that has described uh, many species in 1981 for Australia and that has done a fantastic revision of Solanaceae for New Guinea in 1985. The second place of diversity in the old world is definitely Africa and Madagascar. Uh, with around 76 native species. So keep in mind that here the numbers are, uh, the figures are for native species only, not for the new world uh, introduced in the old world. So African Madagascar, 76 species, and we really know them now because it's a recent revision by uh, Maria Voronsova and Sandy Knapp in 2016. And actually the less diverse place is tropical Asia. So I'm excluding uh, New Guinea from tropical Asia, and you will see why. And today, uh, with all the work we've done, uh, we think that there is 36 species uh, of uh, spiny solanum that are native of uh, tropical Asia. So we'll get back uh, to this number uh, later. So how oh, this diversity for tropical Asia has been described through time. Uh, so just a brief historical glance. Uh, so the first person uh, that has described, that has given binomial name uh, to, uh, to uh, tropical Asian uh, spiny solanum is, of course, Linnaeus. It's not described many plants. Uh, it's four very common tropical Asian uh, sol spiny solanum. It's Malongena, so the eggplant itself, the word relative of the eggplant, solanum insanum, but also two very common uh, and widespread uh, Solanum in tropical Asia, so Solanum trilobatum and Solanum virginianum. At the end of the uh, 18th century, you also had a, a few species that were described, like Solanum procumbens and the two very widespread Solanum pubescens and Solanum violaceum. So these two ones, these two species are very widespread indeed in tropical Asia. So 18th century, very widespread species that are described. The, it changes a bit in the, uh, in the 19th century, uh, first with Blume, uh, so with a Dutch botanist, uh, and has described several species for the island of Java and uh, the Malayan archipelago. So for example, Solanum involucratum, Solanum cyanocarphium, and Solanum pseudosapenaceum. This, 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 this later is an horrible name. And it's beautiful species uh, that grows uh, in Southeast Asia, but also for some, like in Volucratum or Pseudosapenaceum, in the Malayan archipelago. And of course, you had several species and many names uh, that were the species that were described and many names that were given by Michel Félix Dunal, of course, our Solanum uh, chief and god, uh, by uh, the end of the uh, 19th century. So, Dunal has described very common species like Solanum nasocarpum that is very widespread and common all across tropical Asia. But it has also described species that are much less restricted to some areas like Solanum gracilifrarum, Solanum poca, and I will talk about these, uh, these two ones later because they, are very, uh, they have a very interesting story 
uh, behind them. So, but of course, the very interest of Dunal is that it's the last, of course, as you know, entire monograph of Solanum. So it's also the last time that you had all the tropical Asian spiny Solanum in the same publication. Um, in, the, uh, in our century, so the uh, 12th and uh, uh, 21st century, uh, you had also several Asian species uh, that have been described, uh, some like Solanum robinsoni, uh, for uh, just uh, Southeast Asia, so just grows in Southeast Asia. Some others that are very widespread, like Solanum torvoideum, the torvum like species, and from the torvum plate, and that is very widespread across the Malian archipelago, so from the Philippines to uh, New Guinea. And you have some that are endemic to very tiny places, like Solanum deflexicarpum, that is endemic from some places in Ainan, so in South, uh, in South China. Um, so more recently, you also had species described in local revisions or local floras. So it's the case, of course, of the revision of Simon, so in 1985, where you had around 14 uh, new species for Spiny Solanum in New Guinea. So 14 new species endemic of New Guinea for Spiny Solanum. So it's a huge chunk of species. Uh, in 1994, so the floor of China, but without new species in sight. And in 2014, a colleague of Paris published the floor of Cambodia, uh, Laos and Vietnam, with one new species described in sight. And then in India, you have many local flora, uh, but uh, no new species. So no coherent, uh, gigantic, well, no big uh, taxonomical study for all uh, these places in tropical Asia, and that's why uh, this uh, monographic work is, uh, is, is carried and nearly finished now. So this is the taxonomical part, but what about now uh, the, uh, the history of these tropical Asian spiny solanum? So to what group are they related? Um, so first, uh, the first phylogeny to include a lot of a uh, old world species uh, in the uh, Spanish Solanum is definitely the publication of Maya Voronsova in 2013. As you see, it's not resolved at all. I mean, based on relationships uh, in uh, deep nodes in, uh, in Spanish Solanum phylogeny. Uh, but what is sure from this phylogeny is that uh, uh, tropical Asian spiny solanum do not form a natural group, a monophyletic group. So that's not that surprising uh, because African spiny solanum or Australian spiny solanum do not form also uh, monophyletic groups. So it's a poorly sample phylogeny for spiny solanum of tropical Asia. It's fantastically sampled for the African and Malagasy solanum, but it's not the case for the ones from Asia. So you just have nine species that have been sampled in this phylogeny. And what is sure is that they fall in very different clades all across the big polytomy of uh, the old world species. So you have one clade in this publication of uh, tropical Asian spiny solanum. So these four species that are all uh, uh, located in uh, Southeast Asia. So one, one of my uh, job in the postdoc was to uh, try to improve uh, the, uh, the sampling for the tropical Asian spiny solanum. So the sampling I built uh, is definitely representative of the diversity of Asia, Africa, and Madagascar. So this includes New Guinea, actually, here. And for all these places, uh, we assume with Sandy that we had something like 70% of the species diversity for these, uh, for these places. Of course, and like always, like until now maybe, uh, the, the, the sampling for Australian Pacific is, very, is not representative at all. So uh, this is something for the future, is trying to have the best sampling possible for Australian Pacific. But what this phylogeny show, uh, has shown, so maybe the, the major, uh, the key result for this phylogeny is that a tropical Asian spiny solanum are definitely not a natural group. Uh, Tropical Asian spiny solanum are not even all in the old world clade. Some are in other clades. Of course, you have one that is in the Lasiocarpa clade, so that was already known, uh, that you have one uh, Asian species, so solanum lasiocarpum, that is outside of the old world clade. But what was expected 
but never tested before, is that you have several Tovim species, all the other Tovim species are new world, but you have several Tovim species that are endemic of tropical Asia. So it's a bunch of five species, we'll talk about them uh, before. So actually, you have at least three dispersion events from the new world to the old world during the history of uh, this piney selenium plant. So in terms of biogeography, uh, we don't know too much about that. We just have hypothesis because uh, it has never been tested. Uh, but it is sure that many species uh, of Asia, well, some of them, not that many, but actually a part of them, uh, are directly related to African taxa. You also have others that are related to Australia. So uh, most of the tropical Asian species that are related to Australia are New Guinean species. So New Guinea and Australia uh, share a very strong history, uh, close history. Uh, some of them though, uh, some of uh, the uh, Malayan archipelago are also related to uh, Australian species. And you have this relationship between subclades like the old world Torven uh, clade and Lasercarpum, and of course the old world clade itself, but are related to uh, new world taxa. But of course, we, didn't be, we weren't able to test uh, the biogeographic, uh, uh, to rebuild, to reconstruct the biogeographic history, to test biogeographic hypothesis, mostly because of the very poor resolution of uh, the basal nodes within spiny selenium. So, so let's get back to the taxonomy now because it's the core of, uh, of my work. So uh, the, doing taxonomy, uh, doing monograph of uh, tropical Asian spiny selenium is a challenge. Uh, first, because of the sheer size of, uh, of the area. So tropical Asia is something like 9,000 kilometer large and with very different countries and very different climate and biogeography all across the place. Of course, it's a complex zone to study. Uh, also, you had many species, species just known by the type, type, and you had also many names for which we didn't have type specimens. So it has been a bit of a struggle to rebuild the whole nomenclature framework and uh, the taxonomy of the species. And finally, you have places in tropical Asia for which you, you, had, you had nearly no collection at all, or very, very few. Uh, mostly for political reason. It's the case of Myanmar, for example. It's also the case of Sulawesi and the neighboring islands in the Malayan archipelago. And finally, it's the case for the Indonesian part of New Guinea that is dramatically undercollected. So, huge problems. Um, I've done, I, I tried to tackle these issues by looking across air barrier uh, in Europe. So all the biggest air barrier in Europe, well, most of them. Uh, by uh, having a look at air barrier in tropical Asia itself, uh, having loans with, um, with uh, sorry, can you still see, yeah. uh, sharing loans uh, with, uh, what's happening? Sorry, I've got a problem with my computer, I think next one. Uh, sharing loans with big American institution and Finally, uh, putting all the data inside a uh, solid AC source that has, been, that has been a very practical uh, uh, infrastructure for doing this monograph. So now some words on the global framework of this, uh, of this monographic work. So first about the geographic delimitation, because it's a very important point for, for this monograph. And maybe you'll be surprised to learn that actually this monograph is just going to uh, deal with uh, the zone that is between West India and Sulawesi. Uh, we are not dealing with the species that are endemic uh, to New Guinea. And maybe you're going to ask me why, because it's definitely tropical Asia in New Guinea, or well, it's debatable. Uh, it's really because it's debatable first. So as you've seen, most of the New Guinean species are related directly uh, to the Australian species. Uh, but also, it's because there are so few collections. Uh, since uh, the uh, big and fantastic revision of Simon in 1985, there has nearly been no collections for New Guinea. So actually it was really difficult to uh, perform a, a very uh, interesting work of, on New Guinea without having a load of uh, new collections 
So it was really difficult to assess the work of Simon without having better collections and uh, a greater number of collections. So, uh, so we decided then uh, to, to exclude New Guinea uh, from, uh, from our, uh, uh, our uh, monograph. But that doesn't mean that there is no New Guinean species in the monograph. So for example, in the monograph, you will have Solanum tovoidea, which is a species, that is a species uh, that is present uh, in the Malayan archipelago between the Philippines and New Guinea. You will also have species that are not just present in tropical Asia, but also in West Asia, like Solanum pubescens, that also grows in Yemen and Saudi Arabia. Uh, for all the native species, we'll of course provide a full treatment, uh, including maps and IUCN release assessments. And all these maps and IUCN assessments will be, are based on more than 1,500 georeference collections. So this is a bit half the number of collections we have in Brahms, so that is around, so in Solanaceae source, that is around 3,000 collections for tropical Asian native species. In spiny selenium. So now the big, uh, the big numbers, the key numbers. Um, for our monograph, uh, we have identified 36 native species, and that includes two newly described species that you will have the pleasure to, um, to discover uh, in, the, in, the comic in the coming months and, uh, and years. Um, so uh, there, there are eight introduced new world species in tropical Asia, including these four ones that you see here, Solanum torvum, Viarum, Cisimbrifolium, and Rite, that are very common all across uh, the tropics. And for these 36 native species, we have identified around 165 validly published names in synonymy. So this is a lot because this is three times the, more than three times the number of species um, a third of these synonyms actually are synonyms of the eggplant. So the eggplant itself for the moment, we have around 55 synonyms, but I guess that we have not all of them and that the number is going to grow a bit. So synonymy has been, and, and nomenclature has been quite a problem uh, when doing the monograph. And we had like very nice uh, stories and about uh, species and names. And I'm just going to tell you one uh, as an example. Um, so this is a story about two names and two species described by Dunal. Uh, and these two names are Solanum gracidiflorum and Solanum poca. And uh, that was a bit, a, bit, a bit annoying when I, uh, when I, when I tried to link these names with uh, specimens because there were no specimen in either herbarium, or well, in no herbarium around the world, there, there were none herbarium that had these names uh, somewhere on some collections. So these names were just like standing in the air without anything to attach to them. No type specimen and no specimen at all everywhere. So we were a bit, uh, they were really problematic. And this is the only uh, information we had from Lamarck uh, Encyclopedia uh, saying that this plant comes, these two plants comes from Java and that Dunal has seen them in Paris Herbarium. So hopefully what's good is that Dunal has given the name of the collector in the Prodromus in uh, 1852. And he said in the Prodromus that the plant had been collected in Java by Lechno. So you can see here, here Lechno. Who is Lechno? Lechno or Jean-Baptiste Lechno de Latour is a French collector uh, that has been on a trip around the world, well, from France to Australia, uh, with the Baudin expedition during the Napoleonic time. So you know, by that time, there was war between France and all Europe. And uh, the struggle was between the French and the English that wanted to uh, trace the map of Australia. And they sent, uh, so the French sent uh, Baudin and a whole uh, naturalist expedition to Australia, uh, so including uh, a drawing, uh, people that were making drawings, uh, illustrators like Le Sueur that has made this fantastic illustration of plants and animals and, and, and men in, uh, in Australia, uh, but also botanists like uh, Lichno. And, uh, and Lichno, like many other uh, naturalists in the team, uh, got sick. So some, uh, some died actually, but many got sick during, uh, during this expedition, so uh, badly sick. And Lichno was badly sick and left in Timor. 
uh, and he stayed in Timor and in Java for two years. And actually, it's why it's uh, one of the first collectors for Java, actually. And that's why you have many, many type specimens collected by Lechno in Java. What we know is when Lechno came back to, uh, to France, he gave all the specimen to Paris Museum. And that Julien either went to Paris Museum or asked the specimen to be sent to Montpellier to study them. But I've been to Montpellier, I've been to Paris, I've been to Geneva and many other areas around Europe. And I've never seen any type specimen for these two plants. So we assume that they were lost. But we were lucky because Dunal asked to make drawings of his type specimens. So here are the two drawings uh, that exactly reproduce uh, the type specimens of, uh, of Lichno. And when I saw these drawings, I was completely shocked and startled because I knew, I knew these species. I had already seen uh, samples looking like that in collections. Actually, it's were samples of something that had another name, so Selenum arthroanthum. So the name was just falling apart because, well, in synonymy, because this, now we had found Selenum gracilliferum, so it was completely, exactly corresponding. And even more startling, I had specimens that were uh, identified as Selenum sp, so unidentified. You had these microming labels with Selenum sp. And definitely there were uh, Solanum torbum looking, but they were directly corresponding with the drawing of Lechno. So we had found uh, recent collections of Solanum poca that previously was something completely uh, in, uh, well, uh, in, the, in the blur, well, uh, in the fog, actually, for us. So that's great because we managed to, we, we were able to lectotypify uh, these two names based on the drawing of uh, made, made, made for the two species. But also we were able to epitypify the names with actual collections uh, present in, uh, in urban specimens. So this is a short story about nomenclature. And now I'm going to, to give you a brief, because I don't have many time, but a brief overview of the diversity, uh, morphological diversity and geographical diversity of tropical Asian spiny solenum. So for that, I'm going to use this, uh, uh, this uh, resume of uh, uh, the uh, phylogeny uh, published uh, by, by, by Sandy and myself in 2016. So the first uh, species uh, that, that we can see at the bottom, uh, the tropical a first tropical Asian uh, species is Solenum laser carpi. And I think many of you know these species because it really looks like all the laser carpus species, like Solenum ketoense, for example, or Solenum repandum, which is a species, a species from the Pacific Islands. Solenum, Solenum laser carpi is a species very common in tropical Asia. You will find it from India up to uh, New Guinea in the, in the east. So it's a, it's a beautiful species with these huge repent leaves. It's very hairy, very spiny, and you have these fantastic uh, orange uh, hairy fruits. And, uh, and first, we thought, and many botanists thought, that you had a lot of species looking like that in tropical Asia that were related to Solenum laser carpi, but it was not the case. Uh, you have also other species with huge leaves like that, repand leaves, very hairy, very spiny, like Solanum involucratum, Solanum barbicatum, Solanum proetemisum, that grows in tropical Asia. But these ones are not directly related at all with Solanum lasercarpum and the lasercarpum plate. They fall in this huge polytony uh, in the old world plate. So there are very nice morphological convergences in, uh, in this group. The second group of interest that I want to, uh, to spend a bit of time on it is, of course, these very interesting uh, of them uh, from the old world. Uh, it's a group, it's a played actually, so it's, 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 a, it's a very well supported uh, monophyletic group of uh, five species. So there is Solanum poca, so these weird species for which we had no type. Um, and uh, four other species, and all these species really look like Solanum, Ovum, and brothers and sisters. So all the tropical species. Uh, so you have inflorescences with many flowers and many fruits after that. Uh, it's very hairy, it's very spiny. Usually the leaves are huge and quite dissected. And often you have a lot of interpetalar tissues uh, between the petals. So these, these, these plants are gorgeous, like Solanum tovoideum. 
that is very widespread in the Malay archipelago, and some others are much less uh, widespread, like Solanum picuense, that's endemic of Taiwan, so you just find it in Taiwan, or Solanum darmerianum, that is endemic of uh, New Guinea. Um, so these, uh, you, you, maybe you ask yourself, so what are they related to it, to which Torven species? Actually, we don't know. This clade is in polytomy, so in the phylogeny we published. This clade is in polytomy with other uh, Torven species from the New World, like Solanum Torvum itself, Solanum Crasiotrachum, Solanum Pluviale, and others. So for the moment, we don't know what is the uh, closest related New World species. Uh, then, so let's enter into the huge old world plate. And in this old world plate, most actually of the tropical Asian species are falling in this huge polytomy. Uh, so actually, we don't really know the relationship between these tropical Asian species and the other species from Africa and Australia. So one of these, uh, one of, of these species, so they fall into, uh, into small plates, but very poorly supported. And uh, they are formed by these uh, three uh, a bit inconspicuous fishes uh, because none really spiny. Solanum yenqui can be spiny, but the two others are not spiny at all. And uh, so these, these, these plants are quite hairy, but again, no spines, small shrub uh, with these elliptic, typical elliptic and usually small leaves. So Solanum yenqui, Solanum cameronense, uh, and Solanum putti. And you have also another species that is more or less related with this group, that's called Solanum cyanocorphium, a very interesting species because much more widespread than the others, so the others are restricted to uh, Southeast Asia. This one is much more common in the Malay archipelago, and it's a creepy vine, very nasty, so you can see these uh, very black and, and uh, uh, nasty spines on it, uh, and with this uh, acrescent calyx over the fruit. Uh, so it's a very cool species with dissected leaves uh, and I have very few uh, pictures and the DNA for it, actually. Uh, still in this huge uh, polytomy, you will have a bunch of other uh, uh, cute uh, tropical Asian species. So it's the case of these four species, Solanum pretonisum, Solanum barbizatum, Solanum incomicratum, and Solanum whitey. And as you can see, these four species are characterized by acrescent calices. So uh, it's sometimes it covers completely the fruit, like, like it's the case for Solanum priatomisum, but also for Solanum bobizati. Uh, so uh, the calyx is more or less acrescent. It is sometimes very rigid. So it's the case for barbizatum. It's very hairy, very spiny. Uh, and these species are uh, for the, the, the first, uh, the, first uh, the, the two at the top, Solanum paratomisum and barbizatum, it's restricted to uh, Southeast Asia. For Solanum involucratum, it's widespread across tropical Asia. And for Solanum whitey, it's a very weird looking species that comes from tiny places in the Nilgiri Hills in South India. So nice dejection of, uh, of geographical area. Uh, Nice also morphological features. For example, for Solanum barbizatum, uh, you will have uh, the trichomes that are progressively transformed into spines on the calyx, for example. So you have these spines with uh, the, at the top, the rest of the trichomes, of the, of the rays of the, of the scalic trichomes. So it's really cool species. Um, then, so as you've seen uh, in this, uh, in this huge uh, phylogeny on the left, uh, you have a lot of species in polytomy. So these Asian species, the Madagascar clade, that comes from the Madagascar species, a big clade that's called, that we call the Saul Pacific clade, and that includes species from uh, Australia, uh, New Guinea, and the Pacific. So it's a very well-supported clade. And then you have a huge clade that accounts for nearly, for all, for all the African species and for some Asian species. So you have Asian species, for example, in the Giganteum clade. So in the Giganteum clade, you will have Solanum pubescens, so very well known because it has this fantastic aetherandry uh, on the flowers. So you have a huge stamen, the bottom that is really recurved, much longer than the others. So it's a non-spiny plant that is going to be common in India, but also in West Asia. So in Pakistan, in Yemen, in Saudi Arabia. 
but quite costful, so near the coast. Uh, and you have another species that is um, a very intrigu int intriguing species, uh, phylogenetically speaking, because it's, it's a species that always branch in a different place in phylogenetic, in phylogenetic trees. Uh, it's Solenum virginianum, also very common in West Asia and in India. And it's very spiny, this one, with, with these nasty spines all, all over the plant. And uh, usually, this plant falls as sister to all the African uh, species. So it's interesting. Uh, it's, 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 it's very interesting, the phylogenetic position of Solenum virginianum. Um, you have in this uh, big uh, African clade, uh, this huge polytomy there with a lot of species that are uh, unresolved. And in this big polytomy, you will also have one uh, Asian species uh, called Solenum trilobatum. So some of you maybe know this, uh, this little cutie. Um, indeed, it's a very cute plant, uh, but it's also a very nasty plant uh, with all these hooked uh, prickles all across the plant. So it's even, it's the worst in tropical Asia. It's the worst spiny saladum in terms of, of danger when you collect it. And, um, and sometimes it's, it's cultivated in the, well, it's grown in people places because it's a beautiful plant. And uh, interestingly, this one is common all across tropical Asia from India to uh, Cambodia and Vietnam. And, uh, and it's a coastal plant, so you, all, you always find it more or less near the coast. Funny uh, is the fact that uh, it's very, very well uh, proposed as, uh, or suggested to be the sister species uh, to Solanum usaramense, that is definitely the twin species uh, because it's an African plant that really looks the same than Solanum trilobatum, very restricted in Africa, but it's the same. It's a vine with nasty spines and, um, and also a beautiful plant. So it's interesting to see, and costal too. So it's interesting to see these, uh, this group with two species that really look like each other. And then we're near the end of this description uh, with this small clade called the Violaceum clade uh, that accounts for species that are uh, very homogeneous in terms of morphology, not in terms of distribution, but in terms of morphology. It's like little shrubby plant uh, with a lot of hairs, very hairy and very spiny uh, most of the time. A lot of fruits, a lot of flowers, so they are purely hermaphroditic. Um, and you have one species, the Solanum bilaceum, that is well known because it's very widespread in tropical Asia, so from East, uh, East, uh, West India, sorry, up to Sulawesi. Um, so, and even in Madagascar, so an intriguing distribution pattern because you will also find these species in Madagascar and in Réunion and Mauritius. Um, and you have three other species that are very local and uh, that really look, that are very similar to Solanum vilosium. So Solanum deflexicarpum, that is endemic of South China. Solanum uvei, that's going to grow in uh, close to Bombay, uh, in, the, in the mountains close to Bombay and in India. And Solanum multiflorum, uh, that uh, you will find in uh, the Nilgiri Hills, so in uh, Kerala and Tamil Nadu in South India. So it's going to be endemic of, uh, of South India. And last but not least, of course, uh, you have two Asian species in the eggplant plate. And so this is a phylogeny, it's not the same phylogeny, it's a phylogeny that comes from uh, a plastome, uh, full plastome phylogeny, so that we published in 2018. And uh, in this eggplant plate, you will find two Asian species, the eggplant, of course, that has been domesticated in, in, uh, in Asia, in tropical Asia. We don't know really exactly where or exactly when, we know that it happened in Asia. And uh, closely related to, uh, to the eggplant, the wide relatives of the eggplant, the wide eggplant, Saladum insanum. Uh, it's quite a nice species, actually, even if you collect it often uh, close to the roads or the garbage places. So it's definitely a species that is related to human and human activities. Um, but what is gorgeous is the flowers that are uh, nearly rotate. So they're not really stellate, they really rotate like that and spiny all over. And it has a very widespread distribution. Really, it looks really like the distribution of Solanum bilaceum. So it's going to be between uh, West India to Sulawesi, but you will also find collections in Madagascar, in Mauritius, and in Réunion. So a very 
uh, interesting species with a weird uh, geographical pattern. Um, this phylogeny, actually, uh, for the, uh, the eggplant and relatives, has been the subject of the uh, publication on the, on the biogeography of the eggplant clades, on the, uh, on the dispersion of, uh, of the species, um, and with crazy ideas about how they dispersed and when they dispersed. Uh, so I will leave you a look at this paper. I'm not going to discuss it now, a uh, question of time. But if you're interested in how the eggplant clade diversified uh, in Africa and Asia, uh, so you can have a look at, the, at this one. Um, so in terms of perspective now, uh, so what can we do um, now that the phylogeny is, has been done in 2016 and that the monograph is nearly done? Actually, many, many, many things, and not just for tropical Asia, because tropical Asia is something like a link between uh, Africa and, um, and, uh, and Australia and even possibly the New World. So it's a very interesting place. Uh, and, uh, and I believe that if we manage to get uh, better data, and I'm thinking about uh, taxonomical, but also, of course, uh, molecular data to resolve uh, the large scale polytomies that we find in all world spiny selenum, and more largely in spiny selenum, we can answer fantastic questions about the biogeography of the clade, also about the evolution of certain features that are of huge interest, like the evolution of sexual syndromes in uh, spinous selena. We can also answer questions about the evolution of genomes uh, within the group. There are several polyploids, like selenum campylacanthum, closely related species to the plant. Uh, and we can also study the different phylogenetic signals that are uh, told either by the chloroplastic data or by the nuclear data. And finally, I think there are also very interesting speciation questions uh, that can be answered uh, in some clades, uh, sm some small clades, like for example the eggplant clade, that is definitely a very interesting group to study in terms of speciation. So to finish with my talk, uh, I would like to thank all the persons I've worked with during these last seven years, because now it's seven years that I work on this group. Uh, Sandy Knapp, of course, and all the persons in UK and all across uh, the world uh, that have worked with me. Uh, either on the field, in uh, the molecular labs, or, uh, or uh, in the air bio. So thank you very much for this thing. And uh, of course, if you have questions, comments, um, I take everything. Cheers. Thank you very much, Sabria. Very, very interesting, all the work that you have done, and yes, with all the collaborators. So here we have first a uh, question of Richard Olmstead. I oh, know if uh, Richard, you want to turn on your microphone and do it directly. Well, I was <coughs> curious about the name Selenum virginianum for a South Asian species. We're in North America. We're so um, accustomed <laughs> to the species epithet virginianum for plants that were first collected in Eastern North America. Do you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, actually, it's a very interesting question, and I thought that I may add this question, but actually, I, I, I don't remember exactly why it has been called Selenum virginianum if it's an Asian species. So uh, I, I don't really know exactly. Um, there, there has been there has been indeed some kind of mix in my memory. If Sandy was there, I think she could answer that because she's worked a bit on the Linnaeus name uh, for the group. Uh, though I can't tell you exactly if it's a, um, a, a, a North American specimen uh, collection, so in culture that has been given this name. Uh, or if it's an Asian specimen that has, but, uh, that has been given the name Selenum virginianum for whatever reason, I don't know. So what is sure is indeed that there is a, a problem with the, with the name itself when you consider the distribution of the species. That is definitely a, uh, a native species from Asia. So if you have, if you have I, I can't remember the story. I don't remember exactly the story. I'm sorry, Richard. Thank you. But yeah, it's definitely a, a name, a name, a funny thing. Like there are other funny names, like Selenum insanum, uh, for example. If you compare it to the other name of an Af uh, African species that is called Selenum incanum, so and this proximity between insanum and incanum has given rise also to many, uh, many mix between the two names. Above all, because the two plants really look like each other and are closely connected in terms of geography.
Yes, very, very interesting. The, all the etymology and yes, the history of the names, it's kind of, yeah. <laughs> and so many synonyms, right? <laughs> so, yes, I don't know. Uh, any other question for Xavier? You can turn on your microphone or just drop it here. So here is a question of uh, Gina Paula Sierra Reyes. Uh, yeah. She said a bit of presentation, and some of these species has glandular trichomes. Are they concentrated in some clade, or it's just spread all over the phylogeny? Oh, sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Oh, yes. Yeah. If uh, any of these species have glandular trichomes, glandular yeah. trichomes. Uh, and yeah. these yeah. species are in one particular clade, or are just spread all over the phylogeny? Uh, um, Actually, these species that have got, have got glandular trichome is not native to <laughs> tropical Asia. It's Torvum, definitely. Torvum has got glandular trichomes and the pedicels of the flowers and fruits. Um, in my memory, uh, you have others that have got glandular trichome in the other Torvum uh, from the old world. So if I remember well, I don't have the... Uh, the, uh, the um, Sorry, the, the feature in my head, but so that I'm told also has got uh, glandular trichome, but not in the same way that's, than Solanum torvum. You can definitely see the difference. Uh, probably Solanum pocap too has got glandular trichomes. So it's mostly restricted to, uh, to the uh, torvum clade and to the old world torvum species. So I've seen a, a question by Lynn Bose. Yes, uh, sorry, I missed that question. So, Lynn, do you want to turn on your microphone? I see that you are there. Yes, um, great talk, really interesting plants and ones that I'm not that familiar with. So I'm really happy to hear about them. Um, I'm interested in the dispersal, especially um, in those clades where you see the, for instance, in Torva, if you yep. can identify how many really long distance dispersal events uh, might be responsible for these distributions and the vectors or you know how these plants got from place to place and then while yeah. i'm talking i have another question do you find that there are any species except for the cultivated species that are in common natively between tropical asia and for instance the new world you've been a native wood uh, that is um uh, from the New World, and that is also in Tropical Asia, except for Torvum, that's it? No, except for the introduced ones, like, ah, you know, uh, England or whatever. Eleanifolium, definitely. Eleanifolium, Eleanifolium, so okay. Eleanifolium. You, you consider Eleanifolium native in Tropical Asia? Ah, uh, uh, no, maybe no. No, I don't really. <laughs> okay. I yeah, no, 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 that's not true. Uh, no, no, I'm just thinking. No, I, I think there is no. I can't think of any examples. So uh, there is none. No, that's true. There is none. There okay. is none. All the weeds indeed are coming from the new world. So, um, well, it's, 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 it's a real question for Solanum Torben because actually, uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. Torben is a huge problem. Uh, I always assume, and we always assume, that Torben is native from the new world, and it is potentially. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it's men that has brought Torvum to, to, uh, to, uh, to the old world. Uh, I, I had several samples of Torvum, and if you look at the 2016 papers, I've got, I've got samples of Torvum from very different places in Asia, because it's a very common uh, species in Asia. Uh, but I didn't find any structure, uh, specific structure in Torvum, um, phylogenetic structure, definitely. It would be fantastic to do a, a, a study in Torvum to see if it's a weed that is definitely from uh, the New World originally, or if its history is much more complex. So, uh, so that's it. Now concerning uh, the uh, dispersion events in the Torvum plate, uh, we can assume that there is one between the new world and the old world, because all the old world species are within one clade. Okay. Uh, so it's a very strongly supported old world Torvum clade. So the question is, what is the related species? And as I said, we don't really know because this old world clade at the moment is in a polytomy with Chrysotrichum, Torvum, Fluviale, and others uh, new world species, and it's fully unresolved. So yeah, it would be fantastic to see 
what is the closest related lineages to this old world Torvi. Okay, I think Tina has a new project on Torva phylogeny, so maybe right. we'll get to the bottom of that. Yeah, definitely. That's yeah. very interesting. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, there is also another question of Shiny Provence. He said, ah, yeah. is, it, is it there a truly wild Solanum insanum or is more woody? Well, that's the same kind of question, very difficult to answer because uh, it's yes and no. Um, uh, uh, we can't really say that Solanum insanum is really wild in a way that it has no connection with humans. Uh, but it's a bit the same for many species that are uh, anthropo, anthropo, anthropophile, anthropophile, or that love men and love men habitation structures. So, um, so definitely, there may not be some wild, really wild, some of them in Sainam because there has been integration with uh, the uh, the cultivate cultivated eggplant that is widespread. So this integration has been identified as widespread. Uh, in the populations, and, um, and, 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 and there is no population of Solanum insanum that you will find isolated in the forest. It doesn't exist. Solanum insanum is always the small shrubby thing that you will find across, uh, close to the roads or close to habitations. And, uh, and so I agree that the difference between Melongena and insanum is something very blurry, very foggy. Uh, and it's difficult to really cross uh, trace a border. Uh, the lines are crossed very easily. Um, what I think this, um, this, uh, this, uh, this, this border between the two species concepts uh, signifies is that the two species are a bit different, morphologically speaking. Definitely Melongena is much less spiny, it's much less airy. Well, the cultivated ones and the cultivated uh, uh, varieties. Uh, but also because it's very different uh, selection uh, process um, that, that, that underlies uh, the biology and the, phylog uh, the, the physiology of, uh, of the populations uh, for the cultiv completely cultivated ones and the ones that are uh, growing um, widely because it's, they are growing uh, like all across the road. Uh, in, uh, in new anthropogenetic, anthropogenic conditions. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a very, very complex species uh, questions. No, there is no completely wild Solanum insanum, but it's much more wilder that it's a completely cultivated counterpart, uh, Solanum melongena. That could be the answer, like not a black and white answer. That's super interesting, yeah. And um, Ellen Ding has a very similar question to the one of Lynn. That's actually mm -hmm. about uh, if you, um, how is your thinking about how the, uh, the Asian species ended up in Asia? Um, I don't know if, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's something to that or. Yeah. I, so maybe it's Lynn and others that can help me with that. But I think these two of them uh, species, the fruits are eaten by birds. You know? It's mostly bird uh, that eat this, this, this species, yeah. the berries. And... So if I can just butt in, um, I agree, Torvum is probably dispersed by birds and many of the other uh, fleshy fruited, small, especially small fruited solanums probably were dispersed by some kind of birds. But the interesting question for me are the species of the Lazio carpa clade that have really big fruits, and there's some speculation that they were carried by people from ah. the New World to the Old World in pre-Columbian times. You have any opinion on that? Uh, <laughs> 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 well, uh, that's very likely. Uh, why? It's because I've got kind of an opinion on what happened between Africa and Asia in the eggplant clade, uh, for example. So, um, so for example, in the eggplant clade, the fruits are big, so it's endomonaceous species, and definitely the fruits are eaten by huge mammals in, um, in, the, in the savannas in Africa. So like, like, like elephants or impalas. And there are other huge mammals in the savanna in Africa, or they were, or they are still, it's humans. And, uh, and some of them are not that bitter, uh, so some, of course, Solanum campylacanthum is definitely super bitter, but it's possible that there are some population that were not that bitter and that were eaten by uh, our 
uh, Fido Cousins. Uh, so, um, so, so yes, definitely for uh, for these fruits, um, uh, for these huge fruits, they, they they were for some, I think, I, uh, but there is no, there is no proof, there is no archaeological proof, so it's just hypothesis. Um, so they may have been uh, like brought by humans uh, from one place to another, and that's something very interesting actually uh, for Solanum. And something that is really interesting to delve in is this relationship between plants and humans in the past. Uh, the presence of Solanum in Salem and Solanum violaceum in uh, Madagascar and Mauritius and Réunion is really, really super interesting and startling. Because as you, as you know, uh, probably as uh, the population in Madagascar, Réunion and Mauritius um, is mixed uh, between Africa and between uh, Borneo uh, populations that traveled uh, the uh, Indian Ocean. So, there is chance that Solanum insanum and Solanum violaceum may have been brought by, uh, by Asians uh, in, uh, in ancient times, uh, well, several thousand of years ago. So it could be very, very, very recent. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's fantastic ideas and fantastic hypothesis, but that's true. It's, not diff it's difficult to test because we just lack, I think, I don't know, maybe you have some fossils and, uh, and some data for that, <laughs> but for the moment we lack data, but it's great. It's great. It's great ideas. Yeah. Sheena also has uh, several questions about this. I don't know, if Sheena, yeah. do you want to um, turn on your microphone? Is she there? Otherwise, um, it's just that I am bad in English, so <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Um, no I want to ask, why do you think that some species have lost their prickles? Because I'm from Colombia, and here in Colombia there are some species in Torba, at least that is like, for example, Solanum hyesi or Solanum crotonifolium that almost have no prickles or just in their trunk? Um, uh, yeah, uh, you had some loss of prickles, I assume, in, uh, but we don't know because we have not made no uh, ancestral uh, character reconstruct ancestral state uh, reconstructions, uh, but not in the old world Torvum clade because they are all prickly. Uh, Solanum poca, Solanum uh, pseudosapenisium, it's an horrible name, Solanum damerianum and others, they're all prickly. So not in the Torvum clade for the old world. But in the old world clade, you have some clades of uh, Solanum, species of, of spiny Solanum without prickles. Uh, it's the case of one clade I've shown. Uh, and definitely they are not numerous. Uh, so it is super likely that the ancestral state uh, was a prickly plant but it is super likely. There is no test that has been done on that. Uh, so yeah, there, there may have been several loss of prickles uh, during the history of, uh, of, uh, of the old world clade. That's it. But of course it's not tested for the moment, so. Okay, thank you. Um, the other thing that I want to ask is, I don't know, maybe humans also disperse Solanum torbum because I mean, in Colombia, there is not much uses, but I've seen in Asia and Africa, a lot of traditional uses, even in dishes. Yeah, yeah. Really yeah there is, there is Solanum trilobatum. So you have seen this uh, viney, uh, this viney shrub, very, uh, very spiny. Uh, the small fruits are used in traditional medicine, but it's the same for Solanum lesiocarpum. Uh, of course, it's the same for Solanum insanum, so the word related for the eggplant that has been and the eggplant, of course, but the one related to the eggplant that has like a gigantic number of, uh, of traditional uses. Um, there is much less knowledge, I think, for all the others. The problem in, for Asia is that most, well, I've not, I've not delved into that. So that's one of the things I need to, to, to finish for the monograph, is to, uh, to have better uh, information knowledge about the traditional uses, and mostly for the Indonesian species. For India and China, you have a lot of information on the uh, traditional uses. For other places uh, in Indonesia, Malaya, uh, and Vietnam and, and Cambodia and Laos, it's much more difficult to get knowledge on these traditional uses. So, but, there, but there is, and there is a lot of traditional knowledge that is, uh, that is provided in some revisions. Thank you. There are very interesting comments also about uh, from Thibault. Uh, he said that uh, probably yeah for some sweet potatoes they are also 
um, like uh, that have been dispersed by humans actually from South America to Polynesia. So probably for Solano could be the situation too. Yeah. And also, Richard has some interesting yes. comments. I know if you want to turn on your microphone, and um, because it's about Charlie Heister and about how is the control of this. I, I, when I was a postdoc in the uh, 19, late 1980s, uh, Indiana, Charlie Heiser was still active, though in retirement. And many of you may know Charlie of, by his writings. Uh, his, his book um, about the Nightshade family is something that all of you should read if you haven't. He has a different okay, chapter please. devoted to each species that is of human yeah. interest. Um, but, and he's a wonderful writer, but he had studied the um, section Lasia carpum much of his life and uh, he had them all growing in the greenhouse in Bloomington when I was there. And I remember him telling me that he knew of at least two, maybe three species. I think um, Solanum ketoensi was one that was being worked on in uh, cultivation in Columbia at the time that, uh, where it had been determined that the prickles were a single gene trait and that they could be bred out uh, by finding mutants that, you know, that had, were homozygous for the recessive trait. And um, he, he concluded from that, that the fact that there were not, that this had not happened much in nature uh, was that there was really strong selection for those prickles. And I suspect that's true as a, a plant defense. This is very likely. So I don't know if we have an idea uh, if we have identified this gene. I'm pretty not sure. Has it identified it, or just is it a an hypothesis? The fact that it's a single gene uh, that is um, that is controlling it. Do you know, Richard? If I don't know. His, no. his evidence was simply based on crosses, in which you would no, get a, a three to one ratio in the you know, F. Or whatever. Yeah, that that could be, that's very interesting because if you imagine, and that's that's a very interesting, a very uh, great, well, uh, that's that's a uh, that would be a bright future. But if we manage to uh, to get NGS data uh, with um, target sequencing for a huge majority of the spiny selenium, uh, we could include in these genes that we in the genes we target uh, or in. The, the, the genes were probably likely for the presence or the absence of, of spine, depending on the alleles. So uh, it could be interesting if we include these genes and if we, uh, if we manage to, to get it for all our sampling to see if it is indeed under strong selection. So, uh, so yeah, it's a, it would be a great start is to identify this gene or these gene regions, if there are several actually, and uh, and see uh, how they they evolved through the history of uh, of spiny selenium and check if they are indeed under some strong selection. So yeah, it would be interesting. It would be super interesting to identify these genes and have it for all uh, for a huge majority of spiny selenium. That would be cool. But like 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 potentially the regions that are responsible for uh, the uh, sexual syndromes in spiny selenium. Because I don't know if we know the gene regions that are controlling uh, sexuality in, uh, in, in solanum and more precisely in spiny solanum. Yeah, Chris, I agree with you. I think we have no ideas about them. Uh, so if it's one or several and how they interact. Uh, so if it's a, an, an epistasis network, like the one for cucurbitaceae, for example, and it would be very interesting to trace these, these genes across uh, the phylogeny of spiny selenium. Oh, yeah. But it's, of course, it's a hard work. Here's a, uh, the cover of Heiser's book. This is a yeah. later edition. It has yeah, original woodblock prints to, go, to accompany each chapter. Um, it was initially pub published under the title um, the uh, nightshades, the paradoxical plant. Yeah, I've, see, I've read the I've read the version of Chris Martin. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. it's a fantastic book. This one, you, this one is great. It's quite. I fun. read uh, the section on uh, capsicum to my class every spring. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, I think I quite remember. Yeah. I don't know if there is any other last question. I have one comment. This is Lynn again. Uh, so going back to Selena virginianum. 
that that's yep. a Linnae, a Linnaean name, is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, so I think I I have heard, you know, Linnaeus never visited the New World and actually had very little uh, clear knowledge of its uh, geography. So when plants came in for him to name, and they were from North America, for example, he would name them something, something Virginianum, something, something Carolinianum, you know, uh, just certain spots in the New World that were kind of well collected or well known. But there are a lot of Carolinianums that are not necessarily from the Carolinas. And so I bet it was some kind of confused um, locality from the specimen that he had, that he thought it was from the New World. So it might be a Virginianum uh, thing. Probably. But it, it would be an interesting little sleuthing uh, story to try and, and figure out how that one got named that way. Yeah, I've got the monograph under, just under my eye, and it says in it that the type is written America on it. Ah, uh -huh, okay, okay. <laughs> so, um, so I think there's been a mix, just that there must have been a mix. So written America on it, uh, but of course not from America. So I don't know if the mix has been made by the person that has written the location. Uh, it's very unlikely that there were any Virginianum uh, cultivated in America at that time. I can't Why believe that there would be, but it, the point is that Linnea, Linnaeus kind of picked out just yeah. a few places in, yeah, in the New it. World to name all these <laughs> <people>. <laughs> <laughs> To name them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's funny. So that's it. Yeah, but maybe Sandy has better ideas on this story. I don't know it. Uh, I, I will check. I will check. I will check the story about the, the name of uh, Virginia. Sandy will know. Sandy will Yeah, she will know. She will definitely know. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you. It's great to see everybody. Hi. Yeah, it's great to see you. Thank you. And, thank and actually, I have never talk, I've never talked to you before previously. So it's, even if it's online, uh, it's still fantastic to be able to see you and talk to you. You know, I just have to say that these Solanaceae seminars are so wonderful because we can have participation from everybody all over the world. And I miss seeing you in person, everybody, but this is pretty That's easy cool. and it's great to see you. Yeah. That's Thank true. you. Thank you. Right on, Lynn. Right on. Great job, Xavier. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Chris. you very much for your talk. And yes, thank you everyone for being here. Um, well, and we are going to meet so next Friday to uh, listen to the talk of Virginia Sanchez Huerta from Argentina. And she will be talking about the tribe Ayosiame, which is very, which is very interesting because it has some exciting characters. Well, <laughs> some some aggression. For me, but uh, she will be talking about uh, original, horizontal gene transfer, hybrids, um, also phylogenetics of the group. So yes, uh, if you want, remember that all the abstracts are in the web page, and you can also watch the talks later in YouTube. So thank you, everyone. Um, see you next week. Thank you, Rocio. Thank you, Javier. Thank you. Au revoir. Merci beaucoup. <laughs>